but just as I said before in, in the, the agenda, just running through the, the, the background principles, just as a reminder, this will be very, very quick. Um, the, the four principles that underpin this concept of, of, of co-production um, are as follows. Um, equality. Co-production recognizes that everybody, whoever they may be, they have a contribution to make to help with the process of, of co-production, designing services, of delivering services, of scrutinizing, of consulting, of everybody should be treated equally because everybody has a contribution to make. People have assets that can contribute positively to it. And everybody there sh therefore should be empowered and supported to play a role and to have their voice heard and to contribute. Um, there is and has been as long as I've been in the sector, which is coming up for 20 years, a, um, a, a, a seeming hierarchy. Um, and these hierarchies exist within frontline voluntary sector organizations. They can exist in, in relationships between different organizations. A larger charity is seen as being more successful than a smaller one and therefore maybe has a, a more powerful voice. Um, Staff are, are, are have a better in, are seen as having a better insight than, than, than volunteers. Everybody um, should be treated equally because everybody's perspective is equally valuable in the process of co-production or the concept of co-production. Um, everybody should be listened to and given equal opportunity to 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 share their ideas, their their their, their experiences. Uh, and their knowledge. Um, diversity is, is crucial as well, that actually if we are co-producing a piece of work or if we are looking at designing a new service or if we are scrutinizing how a project is going, that actually we have a full range of people contributing to this and actually make that, that um, um, Sorry, just got a little message here. Um, if it's possible to let BIM back in, that would be fab. I don't think I've got control of that. So, uh, Toby, if you're there, if you could let BIM back in, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, diversity really needs to make sure that, that we, we don't just have the same old characters inputting into co-production because we can get to a situation where the tail wags the dog. We can get to a situation where actually a service is being designed uh, or a project is being developed by people that are not actually going to use it. So actually having a full range of participants um, who are representative of those that are going to use that particular activity, that access that particular service or be part of that project, you need to make sure that it, it is diverse, um, as diverse as possible. Um, when undertaking co-production activities, you need to make sure that access um, is considered and that actually people are able to take part, that we don't put um, we don't put barriers in the way to inclusion, that we ensure that um, people that may have access issues, whether it's physical disability, whether it's English as a second language, whether it's confidence, whether it's other factors that may inhibit or restrict someone's ability to access, to, to, to play a, a, an active part, are considered so actually we need to be flexible and creative and um, it horrifies me hearing Barbara talking about the NHS saying that things need to be done within a week. Mobilising for, for effective co-production is not a quick process, it takes time and part of that is because we need to give people access, we need to give people warning, we need to give people plenty of notice that things are going to happen and we need to actually give people, different people, different platforms in which to engage and to, to, to take part. So accessibility will run through all of the things that we're going to be talking about later. And, and, and for me, I think reci reciprocity is, is, is really important. Um, people need to feel that they are heard. People need to feel that they're getting something out of it. If they're giving their time, if they're giving their their um, opinions, if they're giving their insight, their, their expertise, then actually they need to feel that that's valued and they need to feel that um, that's appreciated and they need to feel that it's actually effective. So if someone is giving up an evening to come to an event to take part in a focus group, 
say thank you demonstrate your appreciation don't just let someone talk for on, on a subject and then that information never get used there needs to be some some, some reciprocity some recognition that actually that is valued and, and appreciated so whatever activities are undertaken within co-production or co-design there need to be these four principles evident throughout if you don't adhere to these four or if you don't have a mind to these four principles then the um the quality of the uh, co-production um could be undermined significantly because it may you may get to the stage where a particularly vocal group or a particularly vocal individual may be skewing some of that co-production. They may have a particular agenda that maybe will, will, will drive that co-production down a particular route. So there needs to be that openness and that accessibility really for it to work. And I think reciprocity is, is crucial. If people are giving up their time and their expertise, you need to just say thanks. You need to demonstrate that it's valued and it's appreciated and that it's listened to. And I think one of the simplest things, and this is your first takeaway from, from today, there's a concept of you said, we did. That's a really, really effective way of communicating to those that contributed that this is what we did. We listened to you, we took, we took this on, this is how we moved your ideas forward, your thoughts forward. So actually just that piece of communication that says, you said this and we did this, is a way of giving back and saying, this is that this is um, what your input has has produced so that's that's your first takeaway is, is just communicating how the co-production has been used um, I, I, I put a slightly more sophisticated slide together for, for, for evidencing this that we, we looked at last week this is the co-production ladder and what I've done is that I've actually presented it um, as it should be seen so Good co-production will be fur moving further up the ladder. Um, so we've got three areas of, 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 of work on that ladder. The first thing is, is bad co-production or non-existent co-production really is at that bottom section of the ladder, the first rungs on the ladder, where an activity, whether it's um, a, a, a grant-funded project, is where you're going and you're doing something to a community or to a group of clients. Um, it, it's, that is a very patronizing position really. Um, and for me is completely devoid of, of any form of co-production or co-design. It's where some, some, a person somewhere has sat down and said, I really think we need to educate these people. I think we need to go and we need to run this activity for them because I, I know better than them. I, I know what they need. And as someone who has worked in the uh, fundraising part of the voluntary sector for a really long time, it's very difficult when you have a funding opportunity sitting in front of you to, and, and you've got a deadline of two weeks it's very, very easy to just sit there and go, well, I know what this particular group of people needs. I know what's needed in this community because because you know, I, I've done the research, I've read the books, I've, I've been in the charity for a long time, I know. You just start typing away. You get, if you're successful with that funding application, you get the money, you then have to get that delivered. And actually without co-production, there've been times when I've seen projects that, that on paper look fantastic, but then you come to deliver it. And the operational staff, the staff that have to deliver that project will say it's completely undeliverable because actually it's not needed. So without co-production at those first two, two runs and under the area of work, which is kind of doing to a group of people, you are running a, a pretty high risk of actually what you're there to do is not what's needed. So you're making assumptions about what a community needs. You're making assumptions about what's right for them you're making assumptions on what they require. And the worst, for me, the worst bit is you're, you're, you're being coercive. You are almost forcing people to, to access a project without them really needing it. So for me, I think in very practical terms, that bottom section really is, is not how we should all be working. I, I, I think as, a, as a, a voluntary sector, we really need more concrete evidence of 
the activities that we are undertaking and the things that we're looking for grant funding for and the things that we're looking to deliver or, or activities that we're looking to undertake, we need that foundation of input. We need that foundation of collaboration and cooperation from the people that we are there to serve. If we're not, we're just trying to ram a service or an idea or a project or a concept down people's throats when they might not need it. So for me, I, I, I think your second takeaway is um, to look at a, a business book, actually. And it was written back in the 80s. And it was written by two academics uh, called Peters and Waterman. And it's called In Search of Excellence. And it's, it's quite an old school publication now. It's been around for, for over 40 years, uh, not for nearly 40 years. Um, and it talks about um, characteristics or traits of excellent organisations. And it's, it, it isn't just from the business world, it's, it's non-government organisations, so voluntary sector organisations. And one of the characteristics is um, being close to your customer. Now, in our world, that means understanding the needs of the people that we're there to serve and working more effectively with, with, with those people. So for me, what they advocated 40 years ago based upon international research was that you get close to the people that you are there to serve. And I think for me, that's really important. So I would suggest that if you look at your organization, so the, the takeaway is try and track that down, look on Wikipedia and just have a read through that to talk about why it's a good idea and how it works. Because it will give you some some, some useful background to, to, to the, the concepts of co-production in the business world and how we can apply some of them in our world. So I would suggest that if you look at your organisation and you think that you are in that doing to bracket, that you tend to put in place projects that you know are right for your organisation based on a hunch or based on assumptions or based on what you've done in the past, you run the risk of becoming less relevant and you run the risk of creating a separation between your organization and the people that you're there to serve. So if you have staff or trustees who kind of go, no, no, I know what's best for them and this is what we're going to do. You need to ask yourself, what am I basing that on? What am I basing that, those assumptions on or, or that, um, that stance? Because if it's what we've done in the past or kind of instinctively you think it's the right thing to do. You are not co-producing, you are not co-designing. You are very much working in a top-down way. So I would urge all of you to think if we are working in that way, stop and look at moving up the ladder of co-production, certainly into the middle section, which I'm about to go on and talk about. And certainly if you, I mean, and aspire to working in that top like level, if you could, which is the doing with. So does every does anybody not understand what we mean by doing to? Good. I apologize for laboring the point, but it's really it's it's really important that there are there are organizations out there that that, that don't actually really have a have a strong grip on the people that they're there to serve. Um, they are there chasing funding. They are there looking for pots of, of funding just to survive. And I've worked, I've, I've delivered training for the last 15 years. Um, and I had an argument in a workshop with someone who said, yes, well, it's very, very well and good, Jason, but you're very idealistic with this. Um, because actually I've got five mortgages that depend upon me getting money into my organization. And my response to that was um, actually, no, you're not there to provide mortgages. You're there to actually support people. You're, you're there to meet the needs of clients of, of your community. That's what you're there to do. You're not there to provide salaries for staff. And actually what can happen over time is that you, you, you tend to get more focused on, well, these are the services. We've got staff that deliver these services. We need money to keep them going. And what happens over time is that the, focus of that charity the, the focus on your beneficiaries or your clients or your service users however we we refer to them diminishes and becomes less and less 
important and actually what happens more and more is it's about keeping the charity alive and keeping the staff in place and actually that shouldn't be what's driving a charity it should be those beneficiaries so it's very easy to slip into the doing to mode um, so what i would like you to do is if you feel that you're slipping into that mode take away as many of these these co-production ideas as you can and start embedding them straight away so what are some can of the I, things can yes. I ask a question so i fully believe what you just said and yeah. as a grassroots charity that's the way I, I we aim to kind of deliver yeah but i suppose what i would what i would question you about in terms of so an organization like myself or perhaps many around the table here this morning will be applying up to the same funding pots of money that larger organizations are applying to. So an example of that would be BBC Children in, in Need has 124 staff costing 6 million a year in terms of actually salaries and running costs. Yeah. So the, the idea that you just gave in reality is that's what a chief executive in an organization like that would obviously have to do and uh, when they're applying for funding, they're actually applying for the same pots that we're applying to. So how does that actually work then? Because we're trying to do stuff with small amounts of money that large organizations actually are not having to. All they need to do is by virtue of being a large organization can say we're doing co-production. Um. I, I, I'm not sure what your question is. So I think my, my question is, is that this is something, the, the way you describe what, how we should be working is, what I'm saying is it's the way that I would actually like to work because I think it shouldn't be about creating salaries, et cetera. It, it should be about the actual work. But yeah. when I've met, met with actually large funders in the past, when we've applied for funding, one of the things sometimes why we don't get funding and we get feedback is they say, well, how are you able to do all this work without not employing tons of staff? And that causes a concern in terms of a risk for us. Sure, okay. Um, that, that, that's, that's new feedback um, to, to me. I, I, I can understand that a funder would turn around and say, we think you're trying to take on too much funding and we're not confident that that money will be spent um, in, in the way that you're suggesting. Um, I, I, I get that. I don't think that having a strong commitment to co-production would ever be a reason that you wouldn't get funding. I think if someone's turning you down for funding, it would be... Um, it would probably be be on the basis of the, the their risk assessment of you. Um, I mean, I I've applied for funding in the past where I I know I've been asking for for more than than they would be comfortable giving. In most cases, they turn around and say, actually, you know, we we can offer you less because we think you can deliver it. But that's that's more an assessment based upon our scale than it is based upon our ability to to, to co-produce. So. I, I just think if there is a if strong evidence of co-production within an organisation, regardless of its size, then I think that actually adds weight to any funding bids that you're likely to be making. So I think what you what you the example that you've given there isn't about you're being penalised for co-producing. I think you're I think it's probably because you are a small organisation that's needing to build the scale and the size. Um, which is a separate issue, but I absolutely feel your pain because you can be very efficient as a small organization. You can de deliver a lot if you're, if you're light on your feet, if you're flexible and adaptable and you, you do a lot voluntarily or you, or you deliver a lot of extra value. If you work smart, then it, people might question that and go, how are they doing all of this? Um, I, I don't necessarily think that relates to co-production. I think that's just a challenge of scaling up and growing um, a small charity. Um, I suppose that would be like a capacity question, wouldn't it, in an application? Pretty Thank much. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the question, Joseph. Uh, 
so yeah, if, if your organization does sit in that in that bottom rank, then you need to, to I think, begin review what we spoke about last week about the reasons why co-production and working more closely with, with clients is, 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 a, is a sensible thing to do. Because um, I think that ultimately work is going to be harder, you're going to be less relevant to, the, to your clients, and it might be that the charity is moribund, it might be that the charity is just it's gone to a point where it can't turn around. The middle section is, is for me, um, probably where most voluntary sector organisations, and this is purely based on my experience, this is probably where most um, voluntary sector organisations sit. <coughs> and really organisations that sit on that, that area on the ladder do consult with their beneficiaries, they do talk to their beneficiaries, they do listen to them, so they may have some robust monitoring and evaluation um, processes in place. They, they might collect feedback proactively. They may um, look at put, putting questionnaires together when they're putting you know, funding applications together. Um, it could be that they have representatives on, on the board. It could be that they um, have a newsletter that's regularly distributed. It could be that they, they proactively undertake engagement activities where they will invite beneficiaries to, to, to share their experiences and their ideas. It might mean that they do it on an ad hoc basis. Um, I, I worked for a, a charity for 18 months. I was their business development manager. And we spoke to our beneficiaries in, in three main ways. Number one was whenever there was a funding application that we were putting together, we would do a survey, we'd have a little focus group that would help with, with ideas and provide evidence that, that, that something was needed. Um, we would do evaluation work on our contracts and our projects. So that was the second way. We, we would give the service users, the beneficiaries, an opportunity to sort of share their experiences. Um, and the third way was that we would send a newsletter out to them to let them know about what we were doing. And always in that newsletter, there was a, a request to, if you have ideas of other things that we're doing, other support needs that you've got, please tell us about it. And in, sort of alongside that was we would carry out an annual client survey just to sort of assess how effective our services were to get some kind of feedback from, from them on what, how we could improve, what we could do differently. So we had pretty, pretty good communication channels with clients, but it was very much about getting them to tell us how we, how we could be better. So what we would do, we would go and do the work, but we would ask them, give us the information so that we can process that information and then go off and do something. We didn't work with them. We just had open communication channels that, they, that, that, that were quite effect, really quite effective. But it was us asking, listening, taking that all away, and then as the professionals, as the paid staff, and as, as, as the um, as the people in the know, we would then go and use that. So actually, we had a relationship with, with our clients, and, and we had a much much better relationship than those working at the doing to stage, but not to the degree that we should have. We weren't co-producing, we weren't co-designing, we just listened. And we asked. So we kind of took half a step towards co-production, but we didn't go the full way. So I, I, would, I would suggest that, 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 you know, everybody as a charity should be comfortably sitting in that middle section where you engage clients, you consult with them, and then you, you tell them what you're doing. You have good communication. I think anybody sitting there should be aspiring to move up into the next section where you begin to work with your clients and with other stakeholders much more effectively you don't just talk you don't just listen you work with because they have a contribution to make they have assets they have resources they have knowledge that's potentially untapped currently so for me co-production it's that top section so you are co-producing you are working with 
clients to come up with solutions. You are co-designing, you are finding ways to work with them to plan services, to plan what the organization is gonna to do to actually put plans in place so that they feel like they're a stakeholder. They're not just a customer, they're not just a client, that the organization is for them and that they're contributing and they're making a difference. So that's where we are with the co-production ladder. Any, any questions on that before I move on? No, okay. Uh, we're not going to have a break. We're going to go straight in. We will have a, look, a break in a little bit because we're still we're still just an hour in, so that's great. Okay. Sorry, Jason. Um, Sorry, yes. Jason. Um, a very quick question is: Is there any strategy in terms of monitoring your co-production? Can you do you have like a table that you could like say, okay? we had a proposed um, project here and we work with this percentage of people that actually gave us the feedback and these were the ones that actually achieved it. Is, is any way of monitoring that just for us to kind of map it better? I, I, what, what I will do, Francisco, off the back of this next section, I will put together a, um, a template that I'll get Toby to email out to everyone which you can use as a, and I think, I think Steve, you, you were looking at this as well, some kind of evidence, some ability to demonstrate co-production. What I will do is put that together so that you can go through and you can look at, this is how we do, how we undertake co-production in these different areas of our organization. You can then share that with funders, with, others within the organization so to demonstrate how you you embed co-production across your organization so I, i'll put that together um Thank i you. do that i'll do that over the weekend and then it will be distributed um early next week so that you, you've got that table that matrix that you can utilize thanks okay thank you just make a note so that, that goes out okay Co-production in practice. Um, what um, the, the way we're going to approach this is to look at the different areas of work where you would employ co where you have the opportunity to employ co-production, and then what I'm going to do is just list out some different ideas on how you can do it. Now, as we go into each section. What I will be doing is putting the challenge out to you guys, because I'm not going to present the information, the answers to you up front. What I would like you to do is to suggest back to, to me activities, ideas, methods, techniques, tools, things that you can use that are based on co-production, that are where you get a range of key stakeholders inputting into those particular areas of work within the organization. So I've got I'll, I'll begin with, with, with this one. You can undertake co-production where you are working with, remember the top band on, on the, uh, or, or doing with on, on the, the top band of, of the co-production ladder. You can do that in your organization's governance. Do we all know, does anybody not know what we mean by, by governance? No, okay, I'll take it that everybody understands what we mean. Can anybody suggest any ways in which co-production, as we've defined it, how that could be embedded in the overarching governance of an organization? What are some of the things that, that we could do? Any, any suggestions? A steering group. Steering group. Yep. What would that steering group be made up of, and what would it what would it do? Well, from the beginning, they should be responsible for the constitution of the the organization itself or the business plan, and each department will have their own representative that will bring forward part of their own experience 
on supporting different elements of the project or the business itself. Yep. So you you can start literally from um, the, the the bottom up, speaking to the end users, uh, speaking to the um, the the people who are going to be um, in, uh, who are going to be engaging in this service, uh, and ask them how they would like their club, for instance, to be run. Um, and how they would like their organisation to, to work and what it would consist of uh, with regards to you know, policies and procedures and how they will feel um, protected and valued. So you can actually ask the participants, as it were. Absolutely, absolutely. What, you, what we've got there is, is when you are forming an organisation, when an organisation is being formed, embed from the outset those user voices, those people that you are there to serve, your beneficiaries, your clients, your, your participants, whatever you choose to call them, get them part of the founding of the organization. Get them to tell you what you should be doing. Now, I've seen so many organizations that have come to me and said, look, we want to start off as a CIC, community interest company. Can you help us do it? Yeah, absolutely. How do you know that what you're proposing to do is needed? How do you know that your organization is meeting a specific need? And very rarely at that stage, is there much co-design or co-production? So actually, I think if, if an organization feels that, or, or if a group of people feel that there is a need for a, a new organization to be created, don't just do your desk research and look out there and say, well, there's no one working in this particular area it's needed. Put the groundwork in to prove that there are people out there who want you to do what you're doing. So I would suggest, and, and, and you're quite right, Lisa, that from the very beginning, that you pull a working group together who may or may not transition into a board of trustees or a board of directors or, or a board of members to actually ensure that they are inputting into what you're going to do, what difference you're going to make, and ultimately what the issue is that you are there to address. So from the word go, getting the people that are stand to benefit from, the, from your work to be part of the formation of this organisation is, is, is crucial. Has anybody got uh, any... Uh, yeah, Ken. Uh, Something to that. Carry, please. Is it possible? May I add something to that, Jason? Please do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? I can loud and clear. It you can. cut out a little bit, but, but go for it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. In our case, in the in the statutory right to manage, at the beginning, usually um the co-production <laughs> principle is, is introduced. But it is possible that in the course of, of um, practice, you could lose it in, in, you know, you could lose it because you are so engaged delivery of the service that you promised at the beginning that you will deliver, that you actually lose the um, people for whom the service is designed. And it is possible that you could start with very good intention, do everything, but how do you maintain the, um, uh, oh, oh, in governance, how do you make sure that you maintain what it is? Yeah, yeah, I'd say that I, you promised at the beginning. Yeah, so, no, I, 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 I'm going to try something a little bit. Um, Risky. I hope I don't lose you, but I've got a whiteboard here in, in, in the old cabin that um, I'm going to try and draw something up that hopefully you'll be able to see. Uh, so this might be a disaster. I apologise if it will be. Um, before I do that, Gary, you've made a point on chat. Could you invite an end user to join your board of trustees? For me, absolutely perfect. I think that makes absolute sense. Um, I would suggest possibly more than one. And I think the organisations that are most effective in co-production 
have um, 100 percent or as close to 100 percent service users sitting on the board as possible. Um, I, I'm working with an organisation currently and 100 percent of their of their trustees are people who live with a long term um, health condition or with a, a disability or who have experience in a caring role for someone with a long-term health condition or, or with a disability. So I think that's really, really important. Um, Penny suggested use it involving volunteers as well, people with lived experience. Um, again, I think that's really useful at that senior, at that board level, certainly when it comes to um, forming an organization, I, I, I think is really important too. Um, I'm just going to pick up on, um, on uh, um, Ken's point about uh, as an organisation develops. I hope you, you'll be able to see this. I've just got to shift it around a little bit, and, uh, unfortunately. Would, would you mind out. if I added something while you were doing that, Jason? So Go for it. Can you, I think, sorry, one I, thing. Can, can you guys see the uh, whiteboard? Yeah. Yes. I can. Carry on, my, Lisa, please. My mic's working now. I had, um, yeah, so with regards to not losing them, you, it, it's important to keep on re-engaging with the, with the end users, with the participants in my case. So, so you don't lose sight and start running into the other sort of like coercion sort of bottom of the ladder. You would keep re-engaging to make sure you don't lose sight of the project of what the, the aim was um, from the very beginning. So it would just be, constantly monitoring and evaluating, um, but talking to the participants, the end users, to make sure that you're on the right track. Because I guess everyone's business head, if you are you know, experienced in th that um, business mindset, you could run off with, with those things which are important, but lose sight then of the, the person that we're supposed to be benefiting. Yeah, ab absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, what, one of the activities that is absolutely crucial for co-production, and there are two elements to it, is communication. That is crucial that you keep talking, but that also that you keep listening as well. So if you are committed to co-production, you must recognize that you will have to spend a lot of time giving information back, updating people. It's that reciprocity thing. Keep telling people, you said this, you gave us this suggestion, this is what we did with it. But every time you communicate, listen, expect someone to come back with an opinion, an idea, some response, some reaction. So communication is absolutely vital. It's a crucial part of co-production. Might I say something on the subject of boards? Because um, I've sort of worked for a range of organizations, large and small. And one thing that I have observed in several organizations I've worked for over the years is service users on the committee, sometimes even multiple service users. But most of the management committee business being done um, by, if you like, uh, uh, working groups within the management committee subcommittees and the service users not actually being admitted to any of those subcommittees for debatable reasons around confidentiality or financial or you know the um shall we say uh, commercial sensitivity and all yeah. of that so, yeah. so particularly pre-existing centralized organizations have and they're not always even very conscious of it but that they keep putting barriers up and have excuses for not having, um, you know, people who aren't conventionally committee members on the committee. Sure, yeah. I, I, I think it's very easy for an organization to get into a position where they have an overly paternal and sometimes bordering on patronizing relationship towards their clients. Um, sometimes full-blown patronizing, I think. Sorry? I said sometimes it's full-blown patronizing. Yeah, yeah, no, I think I think you're right. So I, I, I just think there are times when um, charities just, not just charities, statutory services as well, just get into this mentality that actually, the, like, 
clients can't survive without us. They couldn't, they couldn't oh. really cope without us. And actually, it's a frustration of mine that actually we, we the people we're there to support are sometimes more resilient than we give them credit for. And actually, in co-production, again, going back to the principle of equality, despite someone having 20 years of a, of a complex mental health issue, they still have a valid contribution to make to co-production within an organisation, to co-design. They are the expert in how a service should be delivered. And they should be respected in that way. And we shouldn't be adopting this position of we're paid, we're staff, we know what's best. We've gone away and done our research. We've been, we've gone away and done our training. We've done all our CPD work. We should never be getting into the position with co-production where we turn around and say, we know better than them. They are the experts. They live it 24 hours a day and they should be encouraged to make a contribution. So I, I think that that relationship is really important. That equality element is important, that, that, that principle. I'm just going to pick up on the point that, that Ken was making. I hope you, you can see this. Um, please, someone shout if, if, if you don't. So the creation of an organisation um, normally happens because, because there's, a, there's an issue, there's a problem. And someone somewhere recognises that there's a problem. Is that someone saying that you can't really see it very clearly? You can see it. You can see I'm or you can't see? I can see. Okay, great. Thank you. Normally what happens is there's a, there's a problem. Someone said, look, we, here's an issue. We've got to deal with it. And then they begin to think about, well, what, what's the difference that we need to make in order to address that problem? What, what's the change that we need to make? Now, you could almost look at that and say, well, these are the outcomes. These are, these are the, the, this is the impact that we need to deliver in order to make change to that, to that problem. This is, this is what we've got to create, the difference we've got to create. And then in terms of sort of the formation of it, someone will say, well, actually, if we, if we undertake these activities, these outputs, if we do these things, we're going to make that difference that's then going to go towards make, uh, addressing that particular issue. And then they tend to think, well, what, what inputs, what, what resources do we need in order to do these things that will then make this difference that will go towards contributing towards this problem? And then at some point, someone will say, well, we probably need to form an organisation, create an organisation that will do these things, that will get these resources in, so cash, people, premises, da 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 da. We will get these resources into the organisation so we can do these things that make this difference that then go to address this issue. And what happens over time, now, sorry, in the creation of this, the problem and the people that, that, that this is affected by are absolutely central to that creation or should be because actually the difference normally is the difference to the to the people the, the clients so they are central to this planning and as ken said right at the very beginning your beneficiaries your people are at the, at the forefront of your thinking but what happens over time is that in order to keep doing these things these activities, these projects, these services, the, the, these initiatives, in order to keep these things running, we need funding. So you begin to think more and more and more about the money and about getting the right people and all of that. And what happens that, that within a, 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 an organisation becomes a little bit mechanical, but actually, look, this is what we do as a charity. And we need these resources to do that. And you get into this cycle where it's about the mechanics of the organization. It's the mechanics um, and the fuel to keep that organization going. And actually what happens is this bit here, which is about the difference to people, which then goes towards addressing that issue, tends to get lost a little bit. 
because you do just get into this cycle of thought. If we have these resources, we can do these things. And then if we prove that we're doing these things, okay, we can get more resources. And you get into this vicious cycle of give us the funding so we can do these things because that's what we need as a charity. So what happens is that the needs of the organization overtake the needs of the people that you're there to serve. And we get situations like the one that I described. Um, show that to everybody, um, just in case you can't, couldn't see it really. Um, and that's what, that's what happens um, in, in the situation that I described where I, I fell out with a lady in, in the workshop was that she was very much in this mode where she was just thinking, I need this funding in so that I can pay staff to do this stuff. But actually, if you stay a people-centric and an impact-driven organization, this part, your activities, what you do, your physical activities, your, your client support activities, um, over time, that might change. You might actually, your charitable activities might change. They might not stay the same. You might find that you do something different. And actually, that's that's the sign of a, of a co-designed and co-produced organization is that you do have variety in what it does. It doesn't just define itself by its output, by, by its activities. Um, does that make sense to people? Do they, what, how do they feel about that? Any, any reactions? Yeah, I mean, lots of funders don't, do now ask, though, how have you evolved your users in the design and delivery of your service? So it's not quite as easy as just getting money for your old rope kind of thing. You still have to kind of... Yeah, yeah. Which, which is a good move. It's a really good move on, on the funders' point uh, side of things because they need to play catch up, catch up quite frankly. Um, okay, so back to the screen. Some of the things that we've got, good, uh, good co-production within governance, uh, having the majority of your trustees or your board members or your, your, your governing committee are made up of experts by experience. So clients, people that actually have personal experience of the, the issue that your organization is set up to address. I think is, is, is really, really important because you will get their perspective in some of the strategic decisions that are made within the organization. So that's your first action is have a look at your board. Think about who's on it. Have I got the right people taking part in it? If not, why not? What are the things that I could do differently? Is it that we are not accessible is it that we're running our board meetings um, at a time when it's not convenient for, for people to take part? Was someone asking a question then? Yes. Francisco. Okay, this is through my own experience. Um, by focusing on this co-production was something that I took as my main objective because the group that I want to, to serve is very specific in terms of language, culture, identity, uh, the ones that are actually isolated and not having any platform to express who they are or being cohesive within the community. Yeah. But my lack, the, the, the only thing that I find is that I want to, I created this board just with exactly with the users of the organization because they are the ones that are actually part of it. And I could not look for better insight information than speaking directly to them and listening to their opinions. But what I realized along as a, as a long term is the, the, the niche that I am trying to, to engage with uh, have limited capacities in different areas. Even though it's my prerogative to actually have them as representatives or head of the group, there are things that they need training, and this takes time. Mm -hmm. And what I can kind of keep looking at is 
even though if it is financial support we're going to need, if it even, even though it's specific support on, on uh, writing whatever uh, a paper in Portuguese and then translate it to English, I have been outsourcing all within the community, but I find it that the pace that the, the, the project is moving tends to be, I will have to have a lot of patience. You will, as we said last week, co-production takes time. To do it properly, you get the benefits from it, but it can take time and it can be very slow and it does need someone to drive it. Um, there, there, there needs to be a group commitment. There needs to be a group commitment to the shared, uh, the shared objectives of, of co-production, what you're all trying to achieve through that co-production. There needs to be that, but there needs to be someone who is, who is driving it and who is the guardian of it. And I think in your example, that that's got to be you. Um, board development, board um, capacity building. I don't know, Ian, if there's any support specifically through the CBS with, with, with that kind of thing. Um, certainly board training should be accessible, um, reasonably accessible. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it is hard. I mean, the, the one thing I would say with the board is it shouldn't be static. You should be sort of encouraging people to, 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 to dip in and out, to, um, to, to be on the board for a, a limited period of time. Um, but in those early days when, it's, when you're developing the capacity, the knowledge, the skills, the, 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 the um, sort of productivity of the board, it can be a slow and frustrating um, process. But I, I would not sacrifice you know people with with experts by experience being on the board for someone who is a professional sort of board member because it can undermine the uh, representative nature of that board jason could you yes. could you have like a buddy system so for instance in francisco's um situation you can have someone who is um they're more experienced in setting up business or in their business role, say, you know, background of accounts, or for example, they are um, safeguarding, they would come in support for six months to a year. And then they would eventually when the um, trustees who are the end users when they have experience, then gained experience in that expertise, well, then they can back back off and then yeah. take over. So that would be um, another example of where you are still getting the people in and you're training and then forming then like, you know, this leadership roles within the organization. Yeah. Uh, and then they'll be less dependent then. Um, and then those people can then train other people in your organization. They can then be buddies. And then they, that's how you have this role in sort of, um, yeah, co-production co and training within your organization and you know leadership roles i'm glad you fixed your mic lee so that was perfect yeah i'm not going to add anything to oh, that okay that was perfect thank you yeah absolutely some of the other things that i i've got as well think about the diversity on your on your board um kent the area where i'm based and where we work it's a really hard issue um it, it's really tough um we, I can't remember, there was a survey a couple of years ago where it showed that somewhere in, insane, like over 80% of um, board members across the charity sector in Kent uh, were um, retirement age, um, white British people, the, the, the diversity in, in, in Kent, it, it, given that it's a you know, moderately diverse community was shocking. So actually, having a, a you know some sensible diversity on your board as well so actually looking at your board and saying oh, do we truly represent you know the the diversity of our community the people that we're there to serve again that's that's really important um making it accessible being on the board so if people can't get there in time that you maybe do different times for the board meetings that you encourage people to be virtual board members. So it could be that someone never actually attends a meeting, they just do everything virtually. One of the good things that's come out of COVID is that we're all more comfortable with using things like Zoom and the like. It could be that that could increase your access access um, to, to a variety of participants as well. 
Uh, I quite like the idea of a rotating chair, that you have different people um, who are chairing things because they will bring a different style of chairing board meetings. They will um, have a different um, perspective on the, sort of the, the governance and how governance should be led um, within an organisation. So I think that can keep things really fresh and, and again, get this, the variety and the diversity of perspectives up at, up at board level. Um, you know, and that that could be someone committing to, to, to doing something for a year or doing something for, for six months or even having it that every board meeting, there is a different person chairing it. So you, you've got some, again, the equality element put in there as well. Um, equality and diversity training at board level, um, I think is, a, is, is really useful because again, one of the principles of co-production is about equality. Um, so actually having that understanding at board level um, can be can be useful um, that the organization is being led in a in a um, in an appropriate manner um, I think uh, having a performance review as well where um, annually the organization looks at its co-production performance now this probably goes back to um, one of the questions that Steve had at the beginning, which is how, how do you how do you audit or how do you evidence or how do you review your co-production? I, I think the board need to be the, the, the champions for that or the the um, the customer for that. I, I think if an organization in its um, in its mission statement and in its um, governing documents makes a commitment to working in a in a co-productive or service user-led way, the, the, the board should be demanding that information. They should be saying, look, part of our review of how we've done in the year, we want to know how we've done on co-production. We want to know what have we done in terms of sort of involving service users and other stakeholders in our in our the design of our services. You know, how, how have they been involved in, in our organisation? And actually that should be part of an AGM, it should be part of the annual report, which should be put in there. This is what we said we would do in terms of co-production. And this is how we're involving service users and other stakeholders, that we're not just this independent island that's going off doing our own thing, that we're, we're, we're rooting ourselves in the community. And that that is part of the performance review of the organization. That it's not just how have we done financially, what have we done in terms of our impact, what's our social value performance, I think adding in some kind of review of co-production performance that's demanded by the board, I think is again a really sensible thing to put in place so that the board will say, these are the things that we want to see and we are going to ask you at the end of the year how you've done. So embed it in and make it a responsibility of, of the board to demand that information. Um, I mentioned before about adding it into the governing document. I think actually a commitment to co-production is, 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 is really sensible. Just putting somewhere in, in a, a vision document or a mission statement or making it a priority of your organisation, somewhere within a strategic development plan. I mean, Francisco, you're, you're at sort of the, the, the relatively early stages of your organisation in, in, in terms of setting it up. Um, I, I think if, if you are committing to a certain way of working and a method of working um, and you've got certain behaviours that you want your organisation to undertake, put co-production in there. Put, put in that you want the service user to be, you know, fundamental to your planning and your, 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 um, the development of the organisation, that they are influential. Make a statement, put it in. And then, as I say, when it comes to reviewing how well the year's gone, look at it. How have we done? You know, can we prove that we've done this? What activity have we done? So, keep a keep a co-production diary. You know, just literally, and then review it at the end of the year. Oh yeah, we we, we did that. We involved people in to to input into it, and, and and just you then have that that audit trail, that that record of the ways that people have been involved, but make it a fundamental behaviour within the organisation. 
Yeah, I was saying in terms of trustees, we actually had a session yesterday with Reach volunteering about the role of trustees. Yeah. So I recorded it so I can send a Zoom link. Um, and there was actually quite a lot of discussion about diversity on boards and stuff like that. So excellent. Yeah, really good organisation, Reach. They're fantastic. Um, and they give you access to a lot of trustees that you wouldn't expect to get access to. So definitely for everybody, have a look at that. Um, get hold of it and then register with reach i'm going through the process of doing that for a charity i'm working with at the moment and um yeah you can they will give you access to trustees that you wouldn't get access to otherwise um i think the board should also be looking at annual client survey results as well again that that's it's a really key um resource to, to see how well we're doing for our clients so I would encourage every organization to just do a, a survey where you get feedback from, from, from clients. It, it's a formal consultation, um, but for the board to look at that from through the lens of co-production. So, so, you know, what are they telling us? What do we need to pick up on? What do we need to think about for the coming year by looking back at what, how we've done in the last year as well. So getting the board to look at that, comment on it and, and identify, um, through a co-production lens, what they could be doing more of, I think is, is a, a useful activity. Just gonna have a quick look at what's coming up on the chat. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Right, Gary, I think it'd be hard to persuade the current board to shift its makeup to include end users on the scope you suggest. It, it would be a big move. Yeah, I take that to, to, to sort of sack the current board and look at replacing them fully. Um, Potentially putting in place uh, a, a, an objective for the charity that you add a service user a year, or as I think was suggested earlier on, the possibility of a um, having a service user group that will scrutinise the work of, of, of the, the, the charity and scrutinise the, the, the board of trustees is is um, something that. Um, uh, something that could be quite useful to, to, to get a service user group to work alongside the board, have it as a specific working group. That could be one way that you can increase that that represent that that presence, that input, um, or and, and a representative from that service user subgroup could be a permanent representative on the board of trustees. Um, I, I I think it's a battle worth taking on. There will be trustees who will say, no, 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 we don't want service users because we're the trustees, we know better. You know, I, I, I've been on lots of committees, I know how. I think that's limiting it, but a service user group is a really good way of kind of getting those voices heard, particularly if someone from that group is then a permanent representative, becomes a trustee and is a representative of it. Um, that, that can really help ensure that those, those user voices are heard at that level. Also, if you're a CIO, you've got the option of having um, a wider membership, um, which could be service users. So they're not trustees, but they're members and they could have a certain input into yeah. certain yeah. decisions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So co-production doesn't just happen with staff. It doesn't just happen at, at operational levels. It can happen when you're forming the organisation and it absolutely should happen when you're forming the organisation. But it absolutely co-production should be happening at, at, that, at that board level. Um, you know, the, the responsibility to scrutinise what the charity is doing, the, 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 the responsibility to sort of, you know, oversee the financial performance of the organisation, get co-production happening at those levels, get service users and other stakeholders to be inputting at that level, because then you've got it in your foundations of your organisation. You're not just doing it potentially tokenistically at an operational level. It's built in to the foundations of that organisation. Sorry. Oh, actually, yeah, sorry. Final point there on that. Co-produced AGM. Um, one of, for me, one of the best AGMs I've ever been to, and I, I, I go to a few, and on the whole, they're not great. Um, but one that I walked away from thinking, that was brilliant, was run by Maidstone and Mid-Kent Mind. And the whole thing apart from the very, very formal AGM part of it, which lasted about 10 minutes, which was led by the chair, who actually coincidentally was a, a former 
client of, of, of the mind. Um, the whole thing was run by service users. It was service users telling their stories. It was them talking about the services that they were accessing. It was them talking about the future of those services, what was planned for the, for the future. And they, had, they, they bossed that, that AGM annual meeting, that review um, event. And, and I had to say, I walked away totally inspired totally motivated to support that charity and i think i volunteered to do a half marathon well I, I volunteered to do a half marathon to fundraise for them because you know what they absolutely demonstrated through that agm how much they saw clients as a contributor towards the charity and how important clients and service users were for that charity so actually if you are getting external partners to come to your AGM and, and others to come and see what it is that you do. Get your service users there and get them to play a really leading role in your AGM, your annual review presentation or whatever, whatever it is. Because those voices, those service user voices, created such a goodwill towards that organization that actually it, 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 it still sticks with me now, just the, the, the memory of that. So actually, I, I think that's, that was co-production in, in, in practice, live. Um, and the, the, the format of that AGM, that was decided on by the, by, the, um, by the clients. They said, this is what we want to do with it. And the challenge was simply put to them saying, we've got to do this. We have to do the AGM bit. Can't really change that because it's you know there's, there's some legislation around it. We have to do it in a certain way, but actually the rest of it, what would you like us to do? And they co-designed that, and that they they were given a budget to work with, and those service users loved that because they actually saw it as part of their their ongoing sort of um, kind of recovery in a way that they could take that on as a new challenge. So actually, that that was a really neat example actually of where sort of that 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 what's normally seen as a bit of a stuffy board-led event suddenly took on a, a, a much more engaging stance because service users were actively involved in it. Okay, the next thing is, is, is thinking about the, the strategy, the, the, the overriding sort of direction of an organisation, where it's going, what it's going to focus on in terms of broad brush, brush strokes, what its, what its priorities are going to be, what it's going to be focusing on in very broad terms. So can anybody suggest any ways in which we could take a more sort of co-designed and co-produced approach to, to that? So if an organization was sitting there and was saying, okay, we're gonna plan what we're gonna, or we're gonna look ahead to the position we wanna to get to in the next three, four, five years, what are some of the co-production methods or approaches that they could take to, to do that? How could co-production be present in sort of strategic planning for an organization? Any suggestions, either through chat or, or through making a suggestion? Share what, share your thoughts. Well, again, you could ask the end users what um, their short-term mid plan and, and long-term um, ideas might be what they would like to gain out of it. Yeah, and, and some of the ways that you could ask that, Lisa, any, any, sorry to put you on the spot, any thoughts on how that asking could be done? Um, you, it can be like an informal chat, first of all, then you could also do surveys um, with some more leading questions because some people may not know um, what they want. We've all struggled with like, actually, well, what do I, what do I want? What do I want short term, long term? So to help the um, participants, you could actually do a survey with some questions and then that would lead them in the right direction. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, that's a good one. Anyone else, any suggestions? Or there's some things on the chat. Anyone got any suggestions while I'm looking these up? So feedback analysis and the end user support group. Yeah, 
they absolutely should be feeding into that. Thank you, Gary, for that one. Uh, Penny, by having an open door policy for events and services, we can adjust our ideas about what people need and involve people with new perspectives, encourage clients to become volunteers, event planners, then trustees. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Gary says, need to ensure end user group is not hijacked by a small but vocal minority. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, need to ensure that whoever is leading that, that uh, end user group, the client group, is ensuring that there is adequate participation from everybody, that everybody's given an opportunity to, to talk. Um, everybody has an opportunity to put forward agenda items or make suggestions on the kind of things that should be looked at. Um, yeah, some good stuff coming out of there. Let's just close that down. Let's have a look at what I've got. So yeah, a client survey. Um, putting surveys out there to, to your service users. Again, it's, it's that constant communication. Ask and listen, ask and listen. Client survey, it could be a hard copy. It could be uh, using something like SurveyMonkey. It could be a, an event. It could be um, you, you might want to, to run an event where you get people to vote in different ways. Um, the example of market research that I, I use quite a lot, and I think I may have used in, in a previous workshop, um, Innocent Smoothies. I know it's a business example, but the method still could apply. Innocent Smoothies started up with a group of guys going to a jazz festival, making smoothies um, that they were selling to people. And they asked a very simple question was, should we give our jobs up in the city on Monday and do this full time? And they had two bins for people to put their empty drinks containers in. One of them was marked with yes, one of them was marked with no. And their, their way of testing that feedback was that they took a photograph of the bins at the end of every day. And every single day, the yes bin was overflowing, the no bin was virtually empty. That was their way of getting people to communicate back to them in a very, very simple way. We could do very similar things like that. We could. Potentially, if you have premises that people come in and use, you could set a similar thing up where you just set up a bin and you ask the question with a poster and you get people to respond in different ways. So surveying can be done in a variety of different ways. Uh, use the AGM as a way of, of getting people to share. So if you invite a lot of your service users to the AGM, use votes. Get, say to people, we're thinking about this as our strategy. We're thinking about focusing on these things. Is it right? You know, get people to show of hands, get people to maybe use things like Menti, which is an online polling thing that people could use as well. Um, it's worth putting together a strategic working group that's made up of, of um, service users and other stakeholders and task them with it. Say to them, we want you to define what our strategy should be for the next uh, four or five years. Tell us what we need to focus on. Make sure that it's facilitated so that it's focused, so that it works towards producing a strategy rather than just being a talking shop. But put together a specific working group and invite a broad range of people to be part of that. That could be online. It could be face to face. It could be um, utilizing digital tools. Put, put together a specific working group, possibly, to look at the strategy of the organization. Again, gathering those different perspectives. Visioning is a really nice um, activity to use as well. Because um, sometimes when you talk to people about what should our strategy be, the, the word strategy can mean different things to different people and people might not engage with it as effectively. Oh, I don't, what do I know about strategy? If you get people to come and talk about their vision for what the charity could be doing or what the, you know, the situation that it would like to address, um, that can be really effective. Um, I've done a couple where I've worked with an artist. And what I my role has been is, is to pull a, a group together of people, either as a focus group or, or generally as, as getting people in a room. And I have posed them certain questions. And instead of writing it down as text, what we've had is a massive sheet of paper, an enormous sheet of paper on the, on the wall. And the artist will actually sketch a picture, will actually draw a picture to create a vision. And then when we, what we do is once we've got that 
up. We get people to reflect on it and talk about it. And then what we find coming from that picture are priorities. People kind of going, oh, yeah, I get that. I see what that... And then they start coming up with additional ideas on that. So actually the visioning, working with an artist, and an artist, someone that can do that kind of thing, probably cost you about £200 for a day. But it's a different way of getting people to see strategy. They see the vision of what we could achieve as well. So artist-led visioning workshops are great fun because you're, you're left with a bit of art at the end as well that people could look at and they, they can kind of, you know, they can say, well, actually, we really need to focus on that because that's a great priority. So those exercises, are, they're quite good fun. And they're not, if you talk about strategic planning, some people get really turned off with it. If you get people to sort of come, come and contribute towards drawing a picture of our, of our future and create a vision, people may get engaged a little bit more with that. Uh, service user scrutiny. Well, we've spoken about the service user group. That would be part of their responsibility to to um, comment on any kind of strategic documents to provide their input. So if, if a member of staff, if the CEO is, is sort of um, puts together a strategy, a development strategy for the charity, it should always run through the service user group so that they can you know, put their opinion on it. For me, that's kind of slipping down a rung. That's going back to that middle section on the ladder. That's the kind of... Um, the, the, the it's not so much working with it's it's doing for it's that listening bit I would like to see if a CEO is sitting there writing the strategy they need to be working with service users more closely so as a minimum I would suggest if you're looking at putting a strategy together getting it scrutinized and commented on by your service user group I think would be a minimum really um strategic alignment so what i mean by that is if you're putting a strategy a long-term strategy together for your organization that you make sure it just aligns with other other strategies that exist locally um it, it, it it's it's quite useful to see what other stakeholders are sort of seeing as priorities and, and just try and make sure that your strategy aligns with that that's your I suppose really what I'm trying to say with this is that you're not putting a strategy, your strategy together in isolation. You're making sure it aligns with what service user needs, but also aligns with what others are doing as well, because that is a degree of evidence that something is, is needed. So the strategic alignment is, is, is quite a useful thing as well. So if there are, if there's a housing strategy, you might want to make sure that what you're, what you're looking at doing as an organization is, is, is possibly connected or aligned or, or, or um, in some way affiliated to a wider strategy um, that can help. Um, identifying the organization's priorities, I think has to be part of a, of a sort of co-produced approach with, with a strategy. Um, those service users need to be telling you what you really should be focusing on, what your priorities absolutely should be. It could be within a strategy, a strategic document. You come up with 10 things that we're going to do in the next five years. I would suggest that service users particularly should be telling you what your priorities should be within that list. So ranking those, those activities, those commitments in, in priority order. Get your service users to, to do that and to say, you know, this is how we reach those priorities. Uh, your your co-production board should be signing off any strategy. They should be involved in it. Um, I, I facilitate quite a few strategic planning away days for, for charities. And I always say, if we're going to do strategic planning, I need to see that clients are there. I need to see board members are there. I need to see that staff are there. And I need to see external stakeholders, people who care about your organization or work with your organization are there. Because you then just ensure that when you're looking at that longer term strategy, that you've got different perspectives are taking part of it. Now, if we're talking about accessibility, the accessibility principle of co-production, just doing a one-off strategic planning day, is that the right way of doing it? Could you do it slightly differently? What about having a day, you put the results of that day up, this is what we've come up with, and then you invite people to comment on that, provide different, different suggestions. 
Um, so don't just do your strategic planning over one day. Use a day to come, to come together with a straw man strategic plan, but then invite other people to input into that as well. And again, you've got the service user group, get them to input into it as well. As many people inputting as possible, the better. And it might mean that you run three or four strategic priority days. Again, this is one of the downsides of co-production. That means it would take longer to do. That means it could be more expensive, but you will get different insights, different perspectives, and a more representative view of where you should be going strategically. Do you mind if I add something? Please. <laughs> it, um, it may be a good idea to uh, run more into, I know we've got COVID now, but ordinarily you could run sort of uh, like wine evenings or just so that it's more of a comfortable setting or yeah, run something where everyone, the end users will feel relaxed and be put in a position where they're able to talk freely. And then that's how you can brainstorm ideas and come up with a really sound and effective strategic plan. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've even seen a group down here that's that's really well connected into um, uh, community radio that actually they they almost did their strategic planning via a, a phone in. Uh, so they um, they they the the DJ was interviewing the CEO of the, of the charity, and. Um, and he said, you know, look, we'd really be, this is what we're thinking of doing. We'd really be interested in hearing from your listeners what, what they think we should be focusing on. And um, they, got, they got great feedback from it and, and some new ideas coming in. They, they, got, um, they got people making suggestions about, um, you know, how they could engage with groups more effectively. You know, it, I, I think one of the golden threads that, that's got to cut through co-production is, is communication. I think one of the other ones is, is creativity. Just thinking outside the box. How can we provide a platform for people to communicate and share their ideas with us and influence our thinking? How can we do that creatively? So creativity is, is really, really important within all of this that, you know, creative problem solving you know, we can't get to this particular group. What could we do differently? I know. Let's run a um, let's run a food event where we get people to come along, and they can try different foods. They can come along, and they can, you know, bring the kids along, and they can um, have a go on this artificial ice rink that we've got got set up. They can come along and do. It's about being really creative as well. And the nice thing is that a lot of this co-production work could be funded through a funder. You know, there are ways that co-production can be funded, so it doesn't necessarily need to cost you anything. And I, I would suggest, again, this is a takeaway for all of you, put some co-production activity in your, in your annual calendar, put it in front of your fundraiser, and get your fundraiser to fundraise for it so that it actually it doesn't cost you anything. Get it so that it's, you know, part of your, your, your ongoing activity um, every year that you have these these co-production times. Right. So we, we've spoken about the, the, what we're talking about now is all, sorry, should, do we want a, a quick five minute break? Because we've been going for about two hours now. Do we, do we want a quick five minute break? Yes, please. I wouldn't mind. Yes. We'll do that then. So if we can come back, at, well, let, let's make it 10 minutes. We'll come back at 12. Okay, see everybody back Thanks. here at 12 o'clock, please. Okay, uh, back into it. Um, in terms of planning, now I'm not talking strategic planning. I'm not talking about sort of big, broad brush stroke, you know, where are we going to be in five years? Talking about specific sort of business planning and, and, and sort of planning new services and what a lot of people talk about sort of co-design. Co what, what are some of the ways that we could involve service users and other stakeholders in, in, in doing that? What are some of the methods that we could use? We, we spoke about a couple last week, um, the World Cafe 
concept where an organization turns up in a location and gets people to drop in. Um, we spoke about the um, Lambeth uh, Breakfast Club where some of their planning was, was, was done there, where people would come forward with a, an idea or a suggestion and then it would be spoken about and developed and someone would would write down different ideas. Any, any thoughts on the ways that we could have a more collaborative and involved and co-production co based approach to, to, to planning? Anyone got could any suggestions? Do, could you maybe do an open day with like a sample of, you know, a little taster session of this is what we're planning to do and then it might engage people and think, yes, that would be good. Uh, and then you can get feedback of what worked well on the day and what didn't work well on the day. And then yep. you could then, yeah, it'd help you with your, the, yeah, the planning of the whole concept. Yeah, absolutely. You can do that. The, the, the danger with things like that is, is, is that you can, you have to ask, <laughs> yeah. You have to ask for critical um, critical feedback on something because otherwise it can appear that it, it's a fait accompli. It's like we're just telling you what we've done. We're kind of then slipping into the ranks of, of education. Mm. Um, it has to be presented in such a way where you're saying, look, we think this might be right, but tell us if we're wrong because we really want to hear what you're saying. So I'm a great believer in using the straw man principle that someone somewhere knocks something up and says, look, just beat it to bits so this is what we think but tell us if we're wrong because we really want to hear your ideas on, on how things could be done differently any other thoughts on how we can get sort of service users particularly better involved in, in planning hi jason i don't know if this is um will it make sense um so the charity that i work for wanted to kind of run a parent peer-to-peer -peer group and that from their users that they had, they, there seemed to be a need, but because I was having to run that project, I needed to find out for myself if there really was a need in the area. So yep. what I did is that I contacted another local charity and some of their service users to talk to them about the idea that was being put to me to find out rather than replicating something that could already be in the community and then going out and then actually nobody benefiting because there's too many of the same. Um, so we did a few um, Zoom calls over the last month or so and have actually found that there is a need um, and it is something different. So that now implements my planning. And with the services as I've been talking to, I've been sending them any of the plans that I've got, the ideas, and it's open. So they can send me an email to say, well, we'd like this added. And I see the group, if it does evolve after all, everything, when we can get back to whatever normal is, that yeah. they will be part of how it goes forward rather than me suggesting this is what I think. Um, I don't know if that's if that's if that's yeah. on the right track. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you can do something like that. Um, any any anyone else? Any other suggestions, thoughts? We spoke earlier. I think Penny spoke earlier about volunteers. Volunteers are great for that, particularly at the early stages of planning just to get a bit of a steer, get an, an instant reaction. If you're working regularly with volunteers, let's, let's say for example, there's a community transport scheme and you've got volunteer drivers and someone somewhere has, feels that there might be a need for a, a, to put in place, I, I don't know, to secure funding for a, um, a, um, an ad adapted um, vehicle. I would, instantly to test that go to the volunteers and say we, we've got this we're thinking about maybe doing a bit more planning around it what what, what do you think and gauge that initial response from the volunteers because volunteers are in, in, involved they have a stake they have an interest they they certainly want to um that they certainly want to sort of be valued um and i think that that i think they're a really good place to start i think you know, not just using your volunteers to do to do undertake activities for you, but actually getting them to sort of input in, in a co-productive way is really useful as well. Gary suggested incentivizing people. 
paying people, paying people's expenses and do meetings with lunch. I think that's brilliant. If you're, if you're looking at, you could be running a project that's potentially not working quite so well. And, and, and we did this with, with Toby, with the, um, the Help Through Crisis project that he ran a few years ago, which first time we met Toby actually, um, was to look at um, how we could help with the engagement on that, that element of the project. And um, I think it was working with the food banks. I said, well, look, what's the one thing that's, that's happening with people that are coming to food banks is, is food poverty. They, they, they may be hungry, they may be struggling, they may be not getting the nutrition that they want. So why don't we do something around eating? Why don't we do something around a meal and get people to come along and we can ask them what they need and they can, they can do that over a meal. They can maybe start supporting one another as well. We can start achieving a lot more. So let's just change the format of it. And, and the incentive for, that, for those people to come along was that it might be the only hot meal they would get that day. Um, and it, it, you know, you could look at it as a, as a bit of a predatory activity, you know, but ultimately we're giving someone some hot food and, and they were then sharing their ideas and their thoughts and, and telling us what we needed to be do, doing more effectively. And it worked really well. So actually that kind of thing is really useful, giving people, people reasons to get involved, you know, giving them something back. It's that reciprocity element of the, the game. Um, so some of the things that I, I've got, um, just talk about, um, just explain to people, no, start again, invite people to be involved in the planning that have a stake, that they've got a shared outcome or a shared objective or a shared ambition. They would be the people that would want to, to, to be part of the planning process. So. If you're looking at targeting a particular group, let's say we're targeting, um, well, we've got BIM, BIM in the room. So let, let's say we're targeting Nepalese women who are looking at getting into employment. So the first thing we would do would be to engage with groups that are connected to them. We would then sort of begin talking to them and saying, look, how can we best engage them? What's the best method? So again, talking about access, um, you know, how can we get a variety of ages coming in? So again, we're talking about some of the diversity elements there as well. That would always be when we're talking about co-producing on planning, who are the stakeholders? Who are the people with a shared interest, a vested interest in this particular activity that we, we want to plan? And invite them in would be the first thing and communicate with them in, in a way that's most appropriate. Engagement events, we spoke about events where people can come along and, and sort of, you know, they can talk about a straw man. So if we have a rough idea of what we would like that activity to be, we can we can get them to comment on it. Um, I do find that if we're trying to, with planning, it's really hard if you just present people with a blank piece of paper. So we want to help your particular, um, you, know, you know, women from this particular group, we want to help them back into employment. How do we do it? I think that's too blunt an ask. I think it's, you, you might not get any, anything coming back. So, you know, finding ways of presenting ideas and getting people to comment on those ideas, that, that's effective co-production. You're not, you're not guiding people down a particular route. Um, you're just giving them options to comment on. That's, that's for me, that's a more effective way of, of doing it. Jason, could you just explain what you mean by straw man? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I've used it so much that, that, that I, I take it for granted people would understand that. A straw man really is, um, if I were thinking of running uh, an employability program, helping people into employment, a straw man would basically be a very simple document that I would put together that would say what I would be doing, how I would deliver it, um, and what I would want the outcomes for that to be. So it's a, it's a very, very, very simple description of a project that I would like to roll out. Um, and it's really me putting my thinking down on paper that someone can then comment on. I'm inviting them to be critical of it. I'm in, inviting them to evaluate it and to say, this would be a good idea, this would be a bad idea. You might want to try taking this element out. So it's, it's, it's almost like a sort of figurative line in the sand about this is what I'm thinking of doing tell me if it's right or not so it's it's there to be to be beaten up um 
and and for people to, uh, to 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 comment on whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, the next the next thing I've got here is is survey. Surveying is really important in in pulling plans together, um, particularly if those plan, that plan is for an activity that's going to be grant funded. Um, the lottery, particularly with their um, putting people in the lead strategy, they need to see co-production throughout the life of a, a lottery funded project. So from the, the initiation of the idea, the identif identification of the idea through to the, the planning of it and then the delivery of it and then sustaining it. For them, they like to see statistics about the number of people that have been consulted at the planning stage, the number of people that you've involved and, and have input into it, what they've said, um, you know, the proportion of those people that have suggested a, a particular um, a particular course of action, how many people are supportive of it, how many people aren't. So some formal type of surveying is important. And again, there are so many surveying tools out there and different methods that you can use. Um, that, 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 you know, su surveying is so easy now. It doesn't all have to be a survey monkey survey. It could be done in different ways. It doesn't just have to be, a, you know, someone fills in a questionnaire. Um, and and, and you, again, throwing creativity into surveying, you know, it's a big subject. I, 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 would recommend anybody look at alternative ways to surveying than using SurveyMonkey. But again, use a method that's appropriate for the people that you're gonna be surveying, that you're gonna be talking to, that you're gonna be asking. If you're looking at um, getting feedback from the older generation who may not have digital skills, maybe doing a survey on SurveyMonkey isn't the brightest thing to do. Um, if you are looking at engaging younger people, social media is probably the right platform for doing that. Um, you know, don't use Facebook if you're trying to survey young people. You might want to look at, you know, potentially uh, using things like Instagram, possibly even Twitter. Just use an appropriate survey method. You know, surveys are, are, are crucial to, to, to planning because you collect the results, you then use those results to shape your, your thinking about uh, what the solution would be. Um, if ever you're doing any planning in a co-produced way, ask for people's ideas. Don't just tell them what you want to do and get them to say, yes, that's a great idea. That's not co-production. That's not co-design. That is very much, um, uh, that, that really is very much, um, well, it's informing. It's not even consultation, I would say. Invite people to share their ideas. Um, ask people what they think. Ask people for different ways to do things. That has to be part of a, a planning process. Um, ask people what their support needs are. Ask people what they would need help with. Ask people to identify their barriers to getting involved with a particular project. Um, get people to identify any challenges that may be coming up. And again, you can do this in a discussion. You can do it in a focus group. You can do it through a survey. A really neat thing to do um, and I'm doing this on a big consultation exercise that I'm involved with at the moment. We're going out and we've got two stages to this consultation. The first one is that we're doing a survey. So it's going to be survey monkey. It's going to be hard copy questionnaires being completed. What we're then doing wow. is we're forming a focus group who are going to review. Just hold on one second. We're, we're, we're... I just hope I just hope Biden's worn because I'm a. Sorry, can, we can, can, can no, whoever's talking just is, um, because I'm like a heart. Bleeding Gary, I think you've got your microphone on. Of like the most heart bleeding type. Gary, could, would you be able to just so, move your mic for a minute, please? Um, I desperately, I would have. I'm a. I actually am a Bernie Sanders fan, actually. But that's another matter. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm listening to um, a seminar on co-production. Is Toby there? Because you can actually, you can um, mute him. Um, sorry, yes, it's kind of thrown me a little bit that. Um, yeah, yeah, what we're doing with our consultation yeah. at the moment is that we're going out, the first part of it, we're using SurveyMonkey and, and, and questionnaires that we're distributing. That's the first part. 
The second part of it is where we're going to be undertaking some sort of co-design elements where we're going to get a focus group basically to look at the results of that survey from me that next time but then what we're going to do is get them to actually come up with some of the solutions some of the ways that we can address what's been found in that survey so i was was really annoyed at certain things so um gary lockdown because because i was never really bought into going back yeah, I'm just gonna really let people... I mean, yeah, can you mute Gary? I, I don't like, you know, telling everybody to their faces that they were wrong and I was right, but I was. So I'll keep going. Be... <laughs> I knew it. So I yeah, knew. through the planning, we we want to get want. we want to get the, uh, the is, participants. It has to, struck uh, us as well. Identify any barriers to engagement that they may have. Any uh, thank you, whoever's done that. So any any challenges that they may see with a particular project, any any ways that they can see problems, again, that has to be part of it through whatever mechanism you use, whether it's a survey, whether it's a focus group, whether it's talking on a one-to-one basis. Um, in, ask them, encourage them to share with you what could go wrong with the project as well as what could go right with the project. That, that's really important. Um, get them to come up with some of the solutions. So part of your consultation, part of your planning could be, well, let's look at in detail at what the problem is. Let's look in detail at what, what it is that we need to fix, that we, we need to address with this. And you might not want to put forward a straw man. You might not want to put forward what the project actually does. You might simply want to leave it open and say, we want to hear from you what we should be doing. What do we, within this project, what is it that we should be doing? And actually be brave enough to, to present, sometimes present that blank sheet where you just say, look, you've told us this is the problem. What are the ways that we could actually address it? Because sometimes people can think about the assets that there are in the community, that there are things that you may be unaware of that, that could be a benefit and allow them the space to find the solutions. So again, if we go back to the, to the three stages of the ladder of co-production, what what an organization would do if they were sitting on that middle rung is they would say great you've given us all of this information about what's wrong we will go away and we will find a solution to it that's not co-production what co-production does is saying right you've told us what the problem is now tell us a solution to that tell us what we could be doing within this project tell us what this service needs to look like so that we can so that we're together we can find an answer to it. And the reason that you do that is that actually sometimes those solutions are simpler, more cost effective, easier to deliver, and actually provide you with something that can be delivered like that. And it might even take away the need for grant funding. It might be that you've just got someone who's there and he's doing it. So actually allow in that planning, the the service users and, and other stakeholders to present you with the solutions as well. You don't just have to take what they tell you and then find the solution, make them part of the solution or the problem solving element as well. And you can do this. Question. Go on. Um, when uh, there is a, a behavior that I try to implement, but my question here is, am I going too far by asking the question, leave it in blank, and they come back with the answers and I give them the ownership to follow it through? Is that uh, a step too far? No, because I, I think what you're doing there is, is that they naturally, by sharing their ideas, they have naturally have ownership of it. What I would do in that situation is say, brilliant, I really like what you're suggesting. Come and work with me and let's make it happen. Okay. So you're instantly accelerating this whole discussion up to that top level on the ladder by saying, I love what you're saying. Can we work together on this? How, how can I get you involved? Because I, I, I think this is great. So they naturally have, have ownership. Oh, the yeah. Does that make sense, Francisco? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, it, 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 will, it will probably take longer than if you just go, great, I've got the idea, I'll run with it. But I think in the longer term, you, you, you get more traction, you, you can... Um, clearly demonstrate if it needs to be grant funded, if it needs to be a funded activity, 
you've got evidence of, of, of the co-production, you know, that the beneficiary is actively involved in it. I think it's, it's definitely the way to go. Um, I, I, I think focus groups are really, really, really powerful. Focus groups don't just have to be sitting around a table in a business type environment. You can do them in, in different ways. Um, I had a focus group when I ran a, a, an enterprise project and um, our focus group um, was, we, we'd go for a walk on the seafront. We were lucky we were near the sea, but we would go for a walk and we would collectively, we, we, I mean, we kind of, we blocked the path really as we were walking along, but we would all be talking about particular sort of subject. How can we do this better? We're not doing quite so well in engaging clients in this area. What can we do better? And people would, we, we'd, we'd go and have a chat. So we didn't feel the need to sit around the table. Um, if you look at Lambeth, they've got a focus group. They just all come together and have breakfast in a very informal way together. Um, so I think focus groups don't just have to be this, this sort of facilitated static, sit around a table and have a chat and do it very formulaically. You can actually have a focus group operating in, in different ways. You know, it could be an online focus group. It could be done very differently. But they are, they, they, they are invaluable because they give that space for just thinking and mulling over rather than a, a survey, which is almost a, can sometimes be a bit of a knee jerk reaction to, to, a, to a direct question. Um, by, by undertaking planning in a co-design, co co-production way, you can almost evidence that the activity is needed by drawing up a waiting list. If you are inviting people to contribute towards its planning, they may very well turn around and say, well, actually, you know, when it's up and running, I, I want to be part of this. You can, you may be in a position where you can draw up a waiting list of people that want to be part of it, which can help with proving that it's needed. And a funder getting an application for something where it says, and we've got 50 people sitting there already waiting for it. That can, that can be quite a strong sort of um, argument about some, that, that a particular activity is needed and should therefore be funded. And it's a really good way, planning is a really good way of, of engaging volunteers as well, getting people to, to, to input into something. I worked on a project a few years ago where we, um, we did some community consultation and, and it turned into a bit of sort of co-design work talking about taking over an old redundant cinema and turning it into a community facility. Um, I, I ran two events um, in an evening to give people, working people an opportunity to come and take part in it. I presented a straw man of what I thought we could do in the, in the building, but then said, but I really want to hear from you guys what the ideas could be. We had a board where people could put ideas up, they could put post-its up and all sorts. Uh, we got an artist coming in on the second one who drew a picture of, of what could happen in the space. And off, uh, and off the back of that planning event, we just said, and who would like to volunteer their time to make some of this stuff happen? And we got 40 volunteers. And I think that was out of about 84 people turning up altogether over the two events. So actually, we suddenly had this enormous resource that was available to us to take this whole idea forward. So planning is a really good way of, of, of recruiting volunteers because then they again it's that ownership element that they have because they're part of the planning they're part of putting it together and therefore they want to stay involved and i would also suggest that if you are inviting people to sort of contribute towards planning for an idea or, or, or getting involved in, in sort of setting it up that you get them to um join a, a, a project group or a scrutiny group where they're kind of overseeing it. They're, they're, they're there to ensure that um, it's being developed in the right way and it's not just being pulled back into the organization and then the organization's own needs take over. They can be there to provide that sort of, um, almost be the guardians of, of maintaining the co-production approach to that particular activity. So they, they are just some of the ways that you can embed co-production in, in planning for a specific activity or a project or something like that. Uh, I can't actually see that. I've got something blocking it. Can someone read that last bullet point out to me? Sorry. Uh, letters of support. Letters of support. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, letters of support, actually sharing it with um, involving stakeholders in, in this planning and then getting them to write in support of the project that has been put together in a, in a co-produced way. Again, it's, it can really help with um, demonstrating that the project is needed. So again, it, it, it will increase the, the chance of that activity being funded. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that's really important. Um, Lolita, you, you put a comment on chat about language. Could you could you just expand on that, please? I hope that wasn't telling me off for swearing. Sorry, it was I, your last point. I think you said you said something, and I, I but you. Oh, it was the barriers. Yeah. And so one of the barriers must be language. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that that is really crucial when you do think about when you when you're asking people to to explain you know, what the barriers to engagement would be. You need to consider that when you're trying to get them involved in planning as well. Um, you may need to, to run some of these activities with, with language support. You may need to promote them, you know, using documentation in, in, uh, in, in different languages. Um, and we're not just talking about, you know, we're, we're talking potentially, if you are looking at in, engaging a really broad and diverse group of um, people to input into this. It might mean that, you know, that, that there needs to be sign language support. It could be um, a range of different methods of communicating that are required. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that social media is, is, is a really useful mechanism for getting feedback. Um, there, are some, there are some hidden resources on things like Facebook that you can use, like polling tools, really, really, really good to get to kind of gauge an attitude towards a decision or something that you're, you're thinking about when planning an activity. Um, I, I put a little poll out on Facebook uh, recently about the possibility of setting up a, um, a working hub in the little village I, I live in, um, looking at taking over one of the one of the empty shops so that people could have a, a sort of a, um, a COVID friendly but out of home working environment. Did a little poll on that and got 90% respondents saying this would be great followed it up with another poll just saying okay if we go ahead with this how much will people be prepared to pay for it we got an indi you know got an indication on that what people will be paid for it that allowed us to then do some some sort of crunching some numbers to see if it was viable and we looked at it and worked out that it wasn't viable we then went back to facebook and said look this is this is what we've looked at and this is what the price would need to be would you want to go ahead? And we then got people saying back it's too expensive, we can't afford it. That then stopped us from, from going ahead with it. But we did that in a co-produced way because we consulted and we, we, we you know, we then utilized all that feedback to, to, um, to, to look at how we could take it forward. If we'd had people coming back saying, yes, we can then, we can afford what you found needs to be the minimum price we'd have then opened it up and actually done some more detailed planning in a much more co-design, co co-production type of way. Um, so we went from that, that, that middle rung on the ladder to make the decision that actually we don't think it's right, but let's present it. They came back and said no, too expensive, so we therefore just said we don't go ahead. Um, co-production can take place during the delivery of a particular activity as well. Um, Sorry, I've got some popped up in the chat. Yeah, social media tools. Um, I'll, I'll put all of that into the template that I send through so that you can have a look at all of those. They'll be included, Lisa. So that'll be for everyone to see um, what you can use social media for in terms of co-production. So in terms of delivery, in terms of sort of co-production, co uh, when you're undertaking a particular activity, within your organization. Um, I'm not gonna open it up to everybody because we're slowly running out of time. Um, people can be involved in it in terms of a project group, a scrutiny group. I would always recommend if you've got a longer term project that you get service users to oversee it. Now this could be your governance service user group who they, they look after reviewing it. But I think if it's a big enough project, if it's a, a five year lottery project, I would suggest and again, it's good evidence that you're working in a co-produced way 
having a project group to oversee uh, to oversee what you're doing and to input their expertise and to help with problem solving and to to review how effective it is. I think that's another example of good co-production. Um, getting volunteers involved again, you know, pe experts by experience, getting them to input into the delivery of a particular activity is is useful. Um, it can again, it can slow things down. It can be challenging. Um, I know a community transport scheme where the volunteer drivers, on the one hand, are a godsend because they do a great job of work. But on the other hand, are a nightmare because they're really demanding and they take a lot of the project manager's time dealing with their, their quibbles. Um, volunteers are, are, are wonderful, um, but they can also be hard work as well. But they are an example of something being co-produced, being collaboratively delivered. Working with community partners as well. Um, is, is a good bit of co-production. So getting others to work with you. We don't want projects to work in isolation. You want to be accessing other networks and, and working with others. Um, I would look at, if you are looking at developing a proposal, do ask yourself the question, who could we work with? Who should we work with? What can we do to improve the outcomes for our clients? If, if we work with these other organizations, why should we be working with others? You don't just have to do everything on your own. Yeah, here you are. Ken, was there a question there? No, okay. Um, monitoring is really important because it gives you an it gives you the opportunity to sort of to to, to get information about the um, the the um, impact and the perspective of the 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 clients, um, you know, monitoring something does give you the opportunity to improve performance of a project. You know, don't don't just crack on with delivering it. Don't just crack on with doing it. Take the time out to just monitor it. Look at it. What, how, we, how many people are we engaging? How effectively are we supporting them? Take the time out to just look at your project and monitor it, evaluate it, think about it, because that's a great way of gathering information from those beneficiaries that can that you can use to improve it. So again, one of the benefits of co-production is that it allows you to it allows you to improve the performance of your project, which ultimately is there to improve outcomes for, for the clients. So, for me, an important part of co-production is, is is investing the time and effort in monitoring what you're doing. Um, proactively seek feedback from your clients. Every single client that I give business advice to, every single client that I do evaluation for, I say to them, at the very least, how have we done? Have we done okay? Is there anything else that I can help you with? Just being open enough to get someone to come back and say, you know what? We don't quite think you did very well. We don't think you did very well on that. I don't think you've answered the question really on that. I'm not sure. Just create that two-way dialogue where you're not just talking at people, you're not talking to people, you're getting, you're creating a means for them to come back. Now, feedback forms, quite often you get a, a very flattering um, uh, bit of feedback coming in. I would suggest anonymous feedback is always a really useful way of getting getting honest feedback um, because actually negative feedback means that you've got to do something different and you've got to improve so for me that's an important element of co-production is don't be afraid to say tell us if we're not doing right because we do want to get better we want better outcomes for you we want to perform better so proactively gather that feedback create it might make it easy for people to communicate with you and then act on it um, I, I think a, a sati having a satisfaction score within monitoring and within client feedback is really important. You know, get them to score you. And actually, you know, as a project manager, if, you, if you're kind of sitting there thinking, well, we want a 90% success rate. We want 90% satisfaction that people, nine out of 10 people say we've done really, really well. Then you've got a target. And by asking people to give you a satisfaction rate and coming back, you can then see how you're performing against that. So again, co-production, that's an element of, of, of getting people to, to provide you with the information that you need to do a better job. Um, sometimes it's worth just holding a bit of money back for an innovation 
budgets. Um, now, what I mean by that is if you have got grant funding to undertake a particular activity, why not just say to the funder, we'd like to keep a little bit of this money back so that if through our work with our clients and with other stakeholders, if they see that there's something new that we might want to do or something different that we might need to do, we've got the money there to try it so that we don't have to come back to you, Mr. Funder, the whole time to say, could you give us a bit extra so we can do this? Why not, when you're putting your funding application in, just build in that little innovation contingency to say, look, we'd like to have this. We might not use it, but we would like this just to trial some new ideas that our beneficiaries or others would like us to do. So that, that, that's more of a fundraising activity, but it does deliver, connect into delivery activity because it's, um, it's um, for me, I think it just means that it gives you the space to keep improving the project during its during its lifetime um gary's just sh said that within his organization they're looking at building co-production into their matrix assessment uh which is a, a quality uh a quality um mechanism i i, I think it's crucial for, for a voluntary voluntary sector organization to have elements of co-production in i think it make a commitment to it at the start of a year measure what you're doing, capture what you're doing, um, keep a, a diary of what you're doing and when you're doing it. And then at the end of the year, you can demonstrate clearly how you've done it and what you've done. Um, I've just had a reminder through, which I'm assuming is either from, from, from Toby or from Ian about the, the survey monkey. I think that's gone out to everyone. Please can you complete the feedback? Uh, Cause all of that is, is really important. It's also important for me so that I can, I can make changes for the last remaining workshop that I've got to do. Um, delivery, involve partners and stakeholders, get them to input into um, what you're doing. So gather their information. If you're evaluating partway through a project, get them to share and, and, and talk about what yeah. you're doing as well. Listen and then act on it. Implement any changes that may be required. Inviting them to be part of the project scrutiny group as, as well is quite useful. Um, one of the ways that you can you can embed co-production is peer-to-peer -peer support. So it could be that someone who has come in and has been supported through a particular project, a service user, then could actually be supported to be part of the solution moving forward. You may want to get them involved as a volunteer. You may want to then get them involved, possibly with a bit of additional training to be part of the support team. They might then want to um, look at taking the project forward in their own right in the future. Um, you know, don't just think of people that you support for a project, that they are perennially the recipients of a service, because actually with appropriate support, they could become part of the solution as well. They could become part of the, um, the support mechanism for it. So, and actually, you know, it, it, can, be, it can be really powerful, particularly around engagement. I, I ran a project for, for uh, five years, and my, in the end, my marketing budget, I spent none of my marketing budget because all I did was get clients that I'd supported to go and talk about the, their experience and how the work that I'd been doing and my team had been doing had changed their lives. They were my marketing resource. I paid them to go and talk about how we'd helped them start up their own little business, what, how it changed their lives. And actually, they were ultimately they were the most effective mechanism for engaging new clients because they told the story from the heart with passion and they conveyed really really well the difference that, of, our, of our work so actually they became part of the delivery model they were they were our marketing budget we didn't spend any money on advertising or anything like that um an evaluation use evaluation i would suggest anybody putting any kind of bid in for any sizable amount of money that you do build in some form of external evaluation so that you can get people outside of your delivery team to be sharing how the project has made a difference, how it could improve, how it could be done differently, and really get those other voices involved. Because evaluation will then provide evidence for your next project. It will provide really crucial input into what you do next. So if you're looking at continuation funding through the lottery, your evaluation should have recommendations in that on 
how you can do things differently next time round. So evaluation is really, 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 it's a really good co-production tool because it's gathering information from others to say how well you've done and then potentially provide you with information and the evidence that you need to go and get something else funded. Um, and it helps with forward planning as well. So it, it, it helps you to, to look forward, as I say, evaluation evidence can, can help with that kind of thing. So co-production in delivery, when a project is up and running, again, get people involved because you, because you really can. I suppose the simple solution with all of this is, is just uh, co-production must be embedded throughout your organization to be a truly service user led and collaborative organization. Never, ever, ever forget that all of our organizations were set up to meet a particular need, to meet the particular need of a particular group of people. Whether it's been set up to, to target a particular community, that community is made up of people. So we need to ensure that people are actively involved throughout our organization from governance, having representation on the board, all the way down to delivering that project. We need their input, we need their enthusiasm, their skills, their knowledge, their expertise. So we need to make it that they are equally valued, that we have the, the right people and the truly representative people involved in, 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 in our organizations and that they have a stake in it, that we actually, we undertake that reciprocity and that we make it easy for them to be involved, that it's accessible, for our organizations are accessible for them. So. Um, I, I would suggest if you're ever in a position where you're having to plan something or think about something strategic within your organization, your number one should be, how can I get our service users and our other stakeholders involved in this? Who, who else should I be talking to? Do not undertake that work in isolation. Now, I know that's really idealistic because we're up against time pressures. We have limited resources. I would suggest gathering a bank of people around you who fit in with those four co-production um, principles and just have them there ready to ping an email to or to, to, to chuck a survey out to or to have a phone, phone call with. Don't do it in isolation. Get them, who are the people that stand to benefit from it and can help you with it, get them input in, in the variety of different ways that, that you can see. As, as I've promised, I'm going to put a little template together that will summarise this so that when you are at different stages of um, sort of planning and activity within your organisation, you can look at the different methods, tools and, and ideas that are available to you. So you've got a bit of a guide on it. But I, I would say aspire to be as high up that ladder of co-production as you possibly can, because the higher up the more truly representative you will be of the people that you're there to serve. And, and I think the more robust uh, and resilient your organization will be. Co-productions are great. It's an ideal to aspire to. Um, I think as we discussed last week, there are some tangible benefits that your organization and your community can benefit from by adopting it. Um, and, and I think that those that don't will place themselves at the moment at a, at a bit of a competitive disadvantage. Um, so I, I, I would recommend that you try and embed some practices if you, if you possibly can. Uh, and I think that takes me on to the last slide. So does anybody have, we've got, just about 15 minutes left for any, any questions. Does anybody have yes. any, any thoughts, questions? Please throw anything at me. Yes, I've got one. Um, Francisco, fire away. You, you mentioned that the evaluation just at the end is, uh, is very important, not only for the stakeholders, but also to project of any vulnerabilities that the, first, the project went through, but the key element here is who does that evaluation? Is it a third party? Is done by the group itself? Is a look back on the history or, or how the steps went through it? Well, how can I get a clear um, uh, uh, message? 
across from from of this particular evaluation so that i'll be able because it's very difficult to to actually self um evaluate an organization because everyone has been involved with it emotionally and all that uh, uh what do you say to that uh i i think there are there are ostensibly three ways of, of doing evaluation um I, I, I think that the, the first one is self-evaluation, which is the most cost-effective. It can be embedded throughout the lifetime of an activity um, and is where you sit down and you say, what, could, what are we doing well? What are we not doing well? What could we do differently? What have we learned from this? And just looking beyond the monitoring figures and actually looking at, at what else you can learn and what you can what you can do more of what you maybe need to change. Um, that's the first, for me, the first level of, of evaluation is just taking the time to reflect on how a particular project or activity is going. And everyone should, should and could be doing that. Uh, what you don't want to just keep doing is just, right, we're so busy, we've just got to keep doing it. Take that time out just to reflect. Even if it's just to look at your, your performance, your key performance indicators or your targets or your monitoring, just try and take a bit of time to reflect on it. So if we are 70% of where we need to be in terms of client engagement, what is it, what, why? Why are we at that position? What are we doing? So asking yourself those questions is, 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 is the, so self-evaluation is the first thing. The second thing I would suggest is to, to do some client, um, uh, questioning so you've received a service from us you've been supported by us what do you appreciate about it what's important about it what is it that you you think we need to know about it how can we get better what what satisfaction rating would you give us what do we need to do more of what can you tell us that we don't know about it so that would be the second level of, of evaluation would be to for you to ask those questions what I would say about that is that you may not always get back the truly honest answers that you, you, you might really want, because actually someone might say, you know what, you bailed me out at a time where I was on, on the risk of losing my house. I'm not going to give you bad feedback because actually, you, all right, it wasn't brilliant, but you, you, you kept me in my house. I didn't become homeless because of the help that you gave me. So I'm not going to come back with anything too negative. So if you're asking the question, that might happen, which is the third option for evaluation is that you get someone external to actually do that evaluation work on your behalf. Now, if you've got someone independent who says to that client, you can tell me anonymously, I, I won't log your, your contact details, if you can tell me anonymously how that project has done, I will log what you say, but I will not say that it's from you. I will collect it all anonymously. And then you have that independent collection of information that, that can help with redesigning services and assessing how effective something has gone. Um, so I, 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 I think you've got the three options. You can self-assess where you, you literally just look at it from within your, through your own lens. You've then got where you, you ask your clients. So you've kind of got that, that, beginning to get the consultation element. Um, and then I think you've got the third level, which is almost that third run where you're kind of, you've got someone external and independent to ask those questions. The difficulty as someone who does that third level, uh, I've had to evaluate some, some really badly failing projects and the clients don't like it when you come back with, actually you're really making a hash of this project and the evaluation we've done on Toby's projects, we've never said that. They've all been very well delivered. Um, but actually, there, we've had a couple of clients where we've gone back and said, actually, you're, you're not learning from what your clients are telling you. You are continuing to, to carry on with what you think is right. You're not listening to what they're saying. So we told them about co-production. We gave them ideas on how they could get to past service users more actively involved. And they rejected it out of hand. So they are absolutely stuck on that bottom rung and didn't want us to actually tell them that. So, um, yeah, it, 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 it's you've got the three levels. 
Francisco on that. So you can do it yourself, but you have to be absolutely honest with yourself. You then get the clients to feedback so that there's a consult consultation element in it and you act on that. But then you've got someone independent coming in and just saying, we'll do it, but we will give you honest feedback and you need to be prepared for what we, what comes back from, from the clients and the stakeholders and what we find. Thank you. Gary, thank you for that feedback. That was, um, that was very nice to hear. Anyone else, any, any questions about co-production? On, on, it, it's, it's a big subject. There's a lot of misunderstanding about it. Um, and sometimes people don't get the difference between consultation and co-production. Um, I hope we've answered that through this. May Jason, can Ken, you hear me? Yes, Ken, yeah. please. Um, in your template that you're kindly sending out to us. Yeah. As a footnote, could you just give us a um, lead to it's a website reference to what you would consider success, so, you know, successful models, and could it's you include, yeah. and could you include um, an Australian link? The other website to any of the Australian project that you know of. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank yeah, you very. Thank you very much. much.